but struggling to understand how world leaders who preach freedom and democracy, how elected representatives who claim to stand for rights and equality. I really want to thank you all for being here tonight and for your support. Our guest for the evening is Huwaita Ara. You can read Huwaita's uh, biography in the program tonight. I'll simply say that had not already committed to being here, she would have been at the March on Washington today in D.C. and probably one of the invited speakers. She was just interviewed uh, by CNN uh, this past Thursday, and she is sought after uh, by many, many media outlets as a spokesperson for Palestinian rights. Hers is one of the most compelling and passionate, inspiring and important voices, someone whose moral clarity speaks deeply to my spirit. So we're very grateful, Hawaii, for you being here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everyone. I want to start off by thanking you, Michael, and the India Center for Middle East Peace, the, the board, the program committee for putting on this wonderful event, for all of you for being here. I want to thank Janet and Todd, my wonderful hosts, for your hospitality. Thank you so much for making me feel at home. I really um, struggled with what to say really tonight. And though I am rejuvenated to be in community with you despite these very dark, very bleak times, we find hope in each other. And we must. But I struggled with what to say to you because I don't know what to share, what more I can share with the community who see what's happening, you are raising your voice. Do I share with you how much I'm struggling to understand these events? Not to understand what Israel is doing. I know what Israel is doing and why it's doing it. But struggling to understand how world leaders who preach freedom and democracy, how elected representatives who claim to stand for rights and equality, how people around the world who said, never again, can not only stand by and do nothing as mass atrocities are being committed against a beleaguered, impoverished, caged civilian population, but are actively participating in it, are actively participating in this campaign of annihilation. I struggle to understand how they justify in their heads vilifying those of us who are taking to the streets and speaking out against hate, against killing and oppression, against genocide. We, we the ones who are calling for a ceasefire and for freedom, we are the hateful ones. I don't understand that. And my nine-year-old tries to explain it to me. You might remember her, she was here two years ago. She says, Mama, I'm telling you, their heads are just in another dimension. <laughs> and, and maybe that's it. No. How are those even claiming to support Palestinian rights and freedom and justice now? How are they justifying this by saying this is all about October 7? And those of us who since October 7 have tried to put in context because we must, we are now being anti-Semitic. We are justifying attacks on Israeli civilians. Not only is this 100% wrong, but we and Palestinians know very well, and I believe you all know very well, the history did not start on October 7th. We know that this genocidal campaign is just the latest in a long line of efforts by Israel to consolidate its control over the entire land of Palestine without the indigenous Palestinian people. That is the goal 
of settler colonialism. Now Michael said we used to call it a occupation, then we called it apartheid, and now we're calling it ethnic cleansing and genocide. And these are occupation, apartheid, ethnic cleansing. These are all tactics, these are all policies that are used by a settler colonial state to oppress and to eventually eliminate the indigenous population because settler colonialism seeks to replace the indigenous population. And that's what Israel has been doing slowly for 75 years. And they haven't been so quiet about it. Israel's founding father and first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, said, our demand was not for a Jewish state in Palestine. It was for Palestine as a Jewish state. And how do you make Palestine a Jewish state? You get rid of or severely minimize the non-Jews in the country. And that is what has been happening by the policies that we see in the West Bank, in Gaza, even in what 48 or what is called now Israel, these policies that are meant to and do oppress the civilian population. Even like me, I am a citizen of Israel. Okay? Because my village was taken over in 1948. And Israel likes to boast that it treats Palestinian citizens better than Palestinians are treated anywhere else. You know, we have the right to vote. But what they don't tell you, what you don't know, or there are over 60 laws on the books that legally discriminate against us because we are not Jewish. Because Israel classifies itself as a Jewish state for the Jewish people. So that those who are not Jews inside have to be controlled and kept to a minimum, and therefore that's how they justify these policies. So when we called it, you know, an occupation, and I remember 20 years ago struggling with the media just to recognize, just to say occupation. Even if we say occupation, Israel has been violating the rules that govern occupations. And there are rules that govern occupations because in international law, an occupation is an acceptable state after an armed conflict. But there are rules governing it, and it's expected that after one or two years, they will end the occupation and the rightful sovereign will take over. Israel's occupation has been ongoing for 56 years since it occupied the West Bank in Gaza, and it has been implementing policies that clearly violate the rules that govern occupation, including moving your civilian population into occupied territory, and then confiscating occupied land and using it to build infrastructure for that serves the occupation or for your settler colonial population. Meanwhile, you squeeze Palestinians into smaller and smaller areas of land. You don't allow them to build when they manage to you know, dig well so they can have access to some water, so they can have some vegetation. The Israeli military comes and demolishes it. They don't, in some areas, allow them to build homes, so they are living in caves. And when they do build homes in places like Jerusalem, because they're families are expanding, the military comes and demolishes it. So these are policies calculated to drive the people out, and it has been ongoing. It didn't start October 7th. It started over 75 years ago. These policies have been especially brutal in Gaza. Michael talked a little bit about the criminal closure, sometimes we call it siege, sometimes we call it a blockade. It is a hermetic closure of the Gaza Strip. Now Israel will tell you, well, we still they don't want to live with us into the sea, and Palestinians are a hateful people. That is the propaganda. Israel did pull its illegal colonies and its military from Gaza in 2005. They called it a unilateral disengagement. What they did is place their military all around the Strip and completely seal it so that everything that comes in and out was always controlled by Israel, but that, that closure became more hermetic. So as Michael mentioned, it's poisoning the water. Palestinians can't import things to fix their the water system, their sewage system, to the extent they've had sewage, to the extent that 
before October 7, 110 million liters of, of partially treated or completely untreated sewage was being dumped into the Mediterranean Sea. That Israel's closure policy was an almost 50% unemployment rate. That Israel's closure policies led to 70% at least of the population of Gaza being food aid dependent. And that is not because Gaza is poor. It is because it's a deliberate policy that was intended to bring a civilian population to their knees, to exact political concessions, and that is unlawful. If one story maybe can tell you or to drive home the extent of, of the evil that this closure was, let me tell you the story of Aisha Lulu. Aisha was a five-year-old girl, bubbly, happy, loved her friends in kindergarten, loved going to school. One day it switched, and she began having headaches, and her behavior wasn't normal. Her parents took her in Gaza from one doctor to another, and finally she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. They could not treat her in Gaza. They got permission for her to be treated in a Palestinian hospital in Jerusalem called the Maqasid. It's where I delivered my two kids. Maqasid was only an hour and a half away, but of course she couldn't go. She had to get permission from the Israeli military to go. Now they gave her that permission, but they denied permission for her mother to go with her. They not denied permission for her father to go with her. For any relative that she knew who applied repeatedly, they were all denied. Eventually they couldn't wait any longer and she went with an elderly woman who had permission to go, but she didn't know very well. There was no other choice. She got into that taxi and crying, she headed to Jerusalem Maqasid Hospital. She had the brain surgery. It was successful, but she kept calling for her mother. And doctors called her mother and said, this brain surgery was successful, but she's calling for you. And you need to find a way to get here because she's deteriorating. Because she was so upset. Her mother applied again and was denied. And within a few days, Aisha stopped talking. Aisha closed her eyes and died. Alone. Because of the cruelty of a policy that has no security reasoning. That is how much the lives of the people of Gaza were controlled and decimated by Israel's policies. And the world did nothing about it. A group of us tried to do something about it back in 2008. We organized for two small boats to sail from Cyprus to Gaza through international waters into Gazan waters, not going into Israeli waters at all, to say here as peace activists, we just want to get to Gaza so that if Israel stopped us, which we fully anticipated they would, hopefully we would expose to the world that Israel's policies were not about security because that's what they tell the world, right? Israel is defending itself. Israel, Gaza is dangerous. This is about security. What we plan for every scenario, we didn't expect to get into Gaza, but cutting this story short, Israel decided not to intercept us. And in August of 2008, our two small boats sailed into the port of Gaza the first time ever that any boats had done this without going to Israel. And let me tell you, tens of thousands of Gazans came to the port to greet us. So excited, not because we were bringing them humanitarian aid, but because for the first time they were seeing people actively challenge Israel's policies. Not just issue statements, but say no. We're not going to accept this. And we were mainly civilians from the United States and Europe. Countries that are complicit in this attempt to, and God doesn't know, it's an attempt to get rid of them, and it is supported and funded and enabled by the United States and Europe. And yet they embraced us so warmly and were so overjoyed to see us and to have us. And 
and we promised that we would go back and continue to try to break this brutal siege on them. And we did. We spoke to heads of states and we spoke to the United Nations. The United Nations, which was complaining about not being able to get in school supplies, writing utensils that were on Israel's bad list of things that could not get into Gaza. We said, put your paper and your pencils and all your supplies on our boats and sail to Gaza. Why accept these policies that are illegal? But they didn't do that because of some kind of, you know, international world order and diplomacy that accepts these crimes that are being committed. Shortly after our boats left Gaza, in December of 2008, Israel launched Operation Cast Lead, which was the first time that they launched this huge aerial assault on this besieged population. And it was horrific, with over 1,400 dead, tens of thousands of buildings, homes, schools, churches, mosques, businesses destroyed, 300 children amongst those killed in a 22-day bombing campaign that President Obama at the time didn't have the courage on the first day to stand up and say no. After that campaign, I was with a group of attorneys who managed to get into Gaza to investigate that U.S. weapons were being used and were used in Israel's assault on Gaza. I'll tell you what I saw was Unbelievable, and it's nothing compared to now what we're seeing. But talking to families sitting on top of the rubble of their homes, hearing stories of people coming out with white flags, children carrying white flags who were shot dead by Israeli soldiers. Is that, is that not terrorism? Is that not terrorism? One particularly jarring story is of the somebody family where this extended family gathered in one house to be together and the Israeli military shelled that house and then prevented the Red Cross and the Red Crescent from getting to the house for three days to look for any survivors. When they did get to that house and there were survivors, they found eight children who for those three days were without food and were surrounded by the dead bodies of their parents. What kind of trauma impose on a child? After 2009 and after our report and after continued campaigning to break in Gaza, 14 years later, the criminal closure is still in place. And is launched more destructive assaults on Gaza with people having nowhere to go, nowhere to run. Those children survived the 2008 bombing. Did they survive the 2012 bombing or 2013 bombing? Or maybe the great march of return for Palestinians marched nonviolently only to be shot dead with fish in a barrel by Israeli soldiers sitting on hilltops aiming at marchers. And then the 2021 bombing campaign. If those children survived, I think, I think could those children have been part of the militants that came into Israel on October 7th? And if they were, how do I give myself the moral authority to condemn them for that? Because these children for their entire lives have known nothing but the cruelty of Israel's policies and the total indifference of the world. And I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I don't know how someone who has known nothing but that cruelty and indifference is expected to maintain an ounce of humanity. But somehow they do. Somehow they do, and the people of Gaza and the people of Palestine are a people that insist on life, that love, 
and that just want to live free. That just want to live free. And we have been complicit in the policies that have been denying them that. And so when you hear about October 7th and Israel just defending itself, there's a lot to break down there. When Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005, just a little bit of law here, they continue to occupy Gaza. Okay, they say they don't, but the whole international legal community say they do. Because the measure of whether a territory is occupied is not whether you have boots on the ground, but it's the level of effective control that you have over a territory. And Israel controls, Israel controls what Gazans, Gazans have for dinner. And we see they have cut off electricity, food, water, fuel. Israel controls Gaza, and under international law, although all these world leaders will tell you Israel has the right to self-defense, under international law, an occupying power does not have the right to use military force. It is not self-defense against an occupied civilian population. And if you want to compare it to occupation, is the initial aggression. So you can't go into a house and kick someone out, and then if he pushes you, you shoot him dead. You know, that's not self-defense, okay? So those people are telling us that this is self-defense are doing it for a very specific reason. In the United States, we have laws on the books that prevent, that makes it illegal to supply weapons to any military force that uses it for aggressive purposes, okay? These are U.S. laws. That's why we have to keep saying Israel's defending itself. So we're not in violation of our own laws. And then when they focus on Hamas, we know that Hamas isn't the reason. Hamas wasn't in existence 75 years ago. Hamas came into existence 35 years ago as a resistance movement, as a national liberation movement. And if Hamas was to be gone tomorrow, continue its subtle colonial policies and resistance would continue. Because if you have no resistance, then you just accept your subjugation. Then you are just expected to lay down and die quietly. Would any of us do that? Would any one of us do that? You have to resist. You have to struggle for your freedom. And resistance takes various forms. And through the years, the Palestinian resistance, although you don't hear about it, it has been largely nonviolent. Of course, there have been different forms, just like throughout history, all liberation movements have had violent and nonviolent forms of resistance. But in Palestine, our nonviolent resistance is ignored or vilified. We are still maimed. We are still imprisoned. We are still shot dead. nothing changes and so those that want to use armed resistance find that justification. In 2000, 2005, all the Palestinian civil society put out a large call which is probably one of the largest examples of Palestinian nonviolent resistance and that was a call for global civil society to join us in boycotting, divesting and sanctioning Israel until it complies with international law. And that call was formulated in consultation with our comrades in South Africa, who very successfully utilized divestment. But in the context of Palestine, it is vilified. And in the United States today, there are at least 32 states, including Indiana, that penalize you if you adhere to the global boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign. So. For all those people that say where the Palestinian Gandhi is, but then turn around and vilify all forms of Palestinian nonviolent resistance, it should be clear that these people just want us to lay down and die silently, quietly. And Palestinians just won't do that. And it, you know, it, it brings to mind to me a quote by Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said, freedom is not voluntarily given by the oppressor. 
it must be demanded by the oppressed. And we in Palestine and around the world have been demanding, as I said, violently and nonviolently. But no matter which way we have been demanding, we have been vilifying those powers that have been using and that have really hijacked the international legal order and hijacked international law in order to justify Israel's actions and to protect Israel. I don't know. I don't know if you have been watching. I know the mainstream media doesn't show it, but but footage has been coming out of Gaza, and I know that my heart really can't take you know another image of a father calling out for his kids under the rubble calling for them, listening to hear, trying to chip away at the rubble with a hammer, and then chastising one of his kids, saying, I told you to take care of your sister. I told you to take care of your sister. Well, he knows that all of his children are gone. Another image of a young child sitting by the corpse of their mother willing for them to wake up. Wake up. And before coming here, I saw footage of a young girl who was found under the rubble. Must be the age of my little daughter. She was found alive. She was found alive, but reciting her prayers, expecting to die. And those children that are found alive, as Michael said, one child has been killed every 10 minutes since October 7th, every 10 minutes. But there are over a thousand more children lost and still buried under the rubble. And those that are lucky enough to survive are probably the only survivors in their family. So what is to become of this society and this generation of children who again saw such ruthlessness and what they hear is the statements of our world leaders. Justifying this by saying it is all about Hamas. I hope you all recognize I'm not here to to you know, speak on behalf of Hamas or to make you, you to like them or anything like that. But I just want you to realize that it is deliberate. It is deliberate to desensitize us to the level of brutality that Israel is using and that it had planned to use. So you'll say, oh, that's unfortunate, but war and Israel is defending itself and Hamas is using human shields and it's all their fault. That's why it's important to put this in context and while we are calling for an immediate ceasefire that our political leaders are too cowardly to call for, allowing an entire generation of people to be buried under rubble, we must continue demanding that they call for an immediate ceasefire because our immediate concern is saving lives. And then getting in humanitarian aid, because although some trucks have come in, before October 7th, about 400 to 500 trucks of aid was coming in, and that was barely enough for the population. Now we're hearing about 20, 400 to 500 trucks a day. Now we're hearing 20 trucks got in. 20 trucks got in a day, or getting in a day after what? After three or four weeks of Israel cut off food and water? Who cuts off water to children, to the entire civilian population? That is a war crime. That is a war crime. And what do we hear Biden and Blinken say? Israel is defending itself. And then they'll feign concerns for civilians. You don't hear them from yesterday. Israel bombed a convoy of cars, civilians fleeing to the south like Israel told them to. 
Some footage of 14 bodies strewn on one of the roads. And then they bombed three hospitals. The hospital that Michael, uh, you kind of alluded to, is supposed to be they have been supporting because his late wife died of cancer. And they have been supporting the only one cancer hospital in Gaza. Only one. And that is no longer operational because they ran out of fuel. Only four hospitals continue to operate, and they're on their last drops of fuel. And Israel continues to say, we're not letting fuel in. When you deny the civilian population the necessities of life, that is a war crime. And we don't want to hear Blinken saying, I told them or I advised them about conducting this war humanely or adhering to the laws of war. Because he knows they're not, he knows they planned on not adhering, and yet the United States is still complicit. I said I didn't know what to tell you, and then I've just been talking. So let, me, um, let me just have a try to end with saying, as bleak as it is, our efforts are causing global vibrations and we see and we feel a generational change mm -hmm. we have filled the streets from london to cairo amman to beirut detroit to paris minneapolis to istanbul the senate we shut down grand central station u.n high official resign state department official resign we had two days ago comrades in San Francisco blocking a boat that was meant to take weapons to Israel. We had in the, a, a collection of unions representing three million workers say they will not transport weapons to Israel. And we had Bolivia recall their cut all diplomatic relations as other countries are slowly recalling their ambassadors. Today, he saw the largest protest in the United States in support of Palestinian rights and Palestinian freedom, where black, brown, indigenous, young, old, Christians, Muslims, Jews, all rose up to demand a ceasefire and to demand a free Palestine. And our numbers and our power keeps growing, despite the tremendous repression and other efforts to silence us. One thing to be true, and that is that this effort to silence us, to vilify us, to malign us, is because they are afraid of us and the truth that we tell. But we can't let their tactics work. We cannot be silent. We cannot allow them to continue dehumanizing Palestinians because in that, in that effort, if they succeed in that effort, then we have dehumanized ourselves. Those of you who have been to Palestine know that Palestinians are a remarkable people, and I am so proud to be Palestinian. We are fighting a nuclear state with the most powerful military in the region, backed by an even more powerful nuclear state, intent on erasing us. And despite that, we are fighting to maintain our humanity, and our love for life that has been made so unbearable, and love for a world that has shown us nothing but cruelty and indifference. Palestinians insist on life, insist on love, and insist on freedom. One of our Palestinian poets, Moin Obseso, wrote, yes, we may die, but we will uproot death from our land. And I'm just going to end with one more quote from a comrade. I know posted her parents here. I don't know what year, but Rachel Corey. You know, Rachel Corey was in Gaza in 2003 when she was killed. In 2003, two weeks before she was run over by an Israeli bulldozer, she said, I just want to write to my mom and tell her that I'm witnessing this chronic, insidious genocide, and I'm really scared, 
and questioning my fundamental belief in the goodness of human nature. This has to stop. I think it's a good idea for all of us to drop everything and devote our lives to making this stop. I say to you tonight that together we can and we will make this stop and free Palestine.